Kaplan. Good evening. Welcome to tonight's show. We have a good one for you. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. It was my son's birthday today. Let's all wish him a happy birthday. Jordan turned seven. Happy birthday, Jordan. We had a nice little afternoon after he got back from school. It was great. I'm still suffering from what uh, Joe Vasta always referred to as a bangover after going to a show and just, oh, man, my neck is killing me. Ugh, my leg, everything. Everything hurts. It's a sign that you're getting older and it's terrible. It is what it is, and that's all that it is. But no, that's not what we're here to discuss, except I just want to say it was a great show. I saw Fishbone, one of my favorite bands. If you have the opportunity to see Fishbone and they come to your neck of the woods, do not miss out on a killer show. Uh, the guys are 56 years old, doing two and a half hours almost. Two hours, 15 minutes. That's a lot. That is a long ass time. Um, <laughs> let's. With all that said, let's jump into tonight's topic, which just I am excited to discuss this with you guys. Holy crap. Okay. Ready? I'm just going to share that. I got this from, uh, this is from Gastro Obscura. And we're going to share it real quick right now with you right here. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Get ready. Put your history hats on. We're going to learn some stuff. We're going to go learning today. It's time. Oh, boy. Now, you may have ironically seen stuff like meat jello stuff, but that was like, that's some real, that's real. And like, that was a, that was a fad. It still is. If you go to like a high end place, a high end, like fancy restaurant type bistro place, they're still doing meat jello, okay? It hasn't gone away completely. Let's learn a little bit about its history. This was written by uh, Diana Hubel. I hope I pronounced that right, Diana. On May 10th, 2022 for Gastro Obscura from Atlas Obscura, one of my favorite websites. I love this website to death. Always great stuff there. And we'll read this is so this is an a, a portrait of Jules Harder from 1874. And he was the chef at the Palace Hotel in San Francisco. And you can see here he has uh, a strange crustacean on top of a gelatin. It's a gelatin crustacean. That's great. I really like that. I like this painting. I like this guy with his mutton chop, his mutton chop situation going on. That's fan. That is fantastic. All right, ready? Let's let's dive in, shall we? The lamb ribs lie in a precisely arranged herringbone pattern surrounded by nubs of green beans, hard-boiled eggs, and capers all entombed in a flavor... <laughs> Hi! That's too funny, man. In a flavorless, wobbling mass, a two-tiered tower harbors swirling clouds of mayonnaise anchored by erect stalks of asparagus, an acid green lime flavor, <laughs> lime flavored mold holds a can's worth of tuna speckled with pimento olives. Few feuds, <laughs> few foods today feel as anachronistic as the gelatin Salads, a catch all term for dishes sweet, savory, and everything in between of mid century America. Bravo on that first paragraph was just delicious to read. I just, I loved it. And I could so visually, uh, I could visually see everything that was being described to me, uh, verbally in, in the paragraph. Man. It just, you know, as like, a, you know, someone who likes to tell stories and write like that really just gets my creative juices flowing. And uh, I got to send it to my friend, Bob Rowe. Shout out to Bob Rowe because I know that he appreciates this stuff as much as I do. 
As with so many things considered cutting edge from the early to mid 1900s, this former feud of the blah, 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 this former food of the future is now a subject of derision and a morbid fascination. <laughs> I love it. I love it so much, man. And I love it like people out there like actually there were people out there i mean this was like what you would do you would eat these these abominations facebook groups like crimes against jello and vegetables and other mid-century transgressions and aspis i think this is it's not aspics it's not aspics i think it's aspis aspis I believe that's the, the phonetic pronunciation. And an aspis is a basically it's a savory jello, meat jello. Um, and the gelatin can either be flavorless or be flavored with, with stock, beef stock of some kind. Something like that. What's up, Jacob Bailey? I agree. It does. It sounds like the lower class cousin of meatloaf. I would say actually the opposite. I would say it sounds like the higher class cousin of meatloaf it sounds fancy and you know I, I you know this is one of those moments where i think if i had disposable income that was infinite i would open up my own meat jello restaurant <laughs> just so i could serve dishes like this like and just take it super seriously it'd be a lot of fun so the two groups are crimes against jello and vegetables and other mid-century transgressions and aspis, aspis with threatening auras collectively have tens of thousands of members, all of whom revel in the weirdest examples of the genre. I believe I belong to one of these groups, actually. Whether it's a whole turkey in aspis, for, uh, whether it's a whole turkey in aspis from the 1920s or a gelatin loaf portrait of Queen Elizabeth, the appeal lies in the juxtapositions that feel well wrong. It's what Freud would have called uh, unheimlich. Unheimlich. What is an unheimlich? We have to look up that word now because that's what we do when we're learning, you guys. That's what we do. Well, let's find out what unheimlich means. Oh, man, I am just enjoying the crap out of this right now. I can't even tell you. Uh, it means uncanny or weird, unheimlich. I like it. Uh, but today, but in today's internet parlance is known as cursed. I would say that it's like it's almost it's an ironic thing to like you ironically scoff at this stuff like an eyeball with a set of human teeth protruding under the lashes. The cursed aesthetic hinges on an image's ability to make the viewer squirm. So here we have a meat gelatin mask. Look at that, with fibers worn out of meat. They're made out of meat. <laughs> oh, boy. This is Ken Al uh, Albala got into gelatin during the pandemic. Huh. Aspis, aspic, I guess aspics? I don't know how to pronounce this word. Uh, weren't always cursed, though. Despite their present-day associations with 20th century American food gone awry, savory gelatin dishes are neither originally American nor particularly processed. For nearly a thousand years, Aspis held a place of honor on festive tables and courtly banquets around the world. The 10th century uh, Arabic cookbook, Kitab al-Tabik, for example, contains a recipe for saffron-stained fish aspic uh, caught in the light like a cut garnet. I, You know, back in the day, like in the Middle Ages or like, you know, whatever, like a thousand years ago, you know, people loved saffron. And like, oh, whenever I like dive into like, you know, historic recipes and stuff, it's always about saffron i don't know what that's what that is all about gelatin is one of the very few foods that goes so radically in and out of fashion from epoch to epoch says ken albala of albala a history professor at the university of pacific the author of more than 2000 books on food history sorry 2000 
two dozen, the author of more than two dozen books on food history and culture, uh, Abala chronicles the story of his current obsession in his forthcoming book, The Great Gelatin Revival, Savory Aspices, j Jiggly Shots, and Outrageous Desserts. So here we have some gelatin with some, we have some octopus gelatin. That's great. <laughs> I love it so much, dude. I love it, man. The next movie I make is going to have jello, uh, jello banquets in it. I am just going to do that um, because it's just so great. Oh, Brian, come on. Brian, our future is meat jello. That's the bottom line. You just have to you, you just have to get with the program. That's just the way it's going to be. This is a uh, tacky. Uh, takoyaki which is like those balls you know they're like japanese balls that are like on the stick and they have the drizzle um but this one's done with baby octopuses and a sake infused jelly yeah i you know brian i mentioned i i didn't mention soda milk earlier but i did mention bob rose and i know how much bob rose loves this stuff he loves it as much as i do and I think you love it too. You just you you ride the fence. You play both sides of the coin. We're in one of those periods where it's totally out of fashion. Abala says that's because it was democratized with the brand, but also because everything Jello stood for progress, uh, mo modern modernity, modernity, modernity. It's modern, but with et at the end. Modernity, modernity, modernity. That's I don't know. And bright colors uh, stands in contrast to the idea of natural, the sustainable, and the artisanal. I mean, the other thing too is that when we think of Jello today, we think of dessert. We think of something that's fruity. We think of something that's sweet. We think of whipped cream. We're not thinking of olives and ham and salmon and fish and octopus and kiwi and whatever else you go in there go you know mix all together tuna tuna gelatin although i bet you the mouthfeel isn't so bad you know you know if you go to the supermarket you know like that they have those like fruit cups you know like like it's like uh, grapefruit or or peaches or pear or whatever in the gelatin man so it's like it does exist in this sort of snack dessert form that seems to be socially acceptable today jake belly jake bailey says wasn't there a conspiracy at one point that gelatin would cause cancer of some kind i did not hear that i do not know perhaps you can look it up and let us know i'm not familiar uh over the last three years abala has earned the nickname jiggle daddy oh my goodness that is just that's delicious and wonderful jiggle daddy for his willingness to attempt all sorts of gelatinous feats some of his more surreal creations include a gelatin covid mask with interwoven strips of raw meat we saw the picture of that earlier as well as the two inverted octopuses in the sake infused jelly their tentacles curled and open maws exposed and they both wonderful what what a sight Ma okay here you're gonna phonetically say it Mod earn itty modern it. Yeah, but but sp yeah, let's see you 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 stitch that all together right now. Modernity. Mod ernity. Moder modernity. It's a silly word, man. It's a word that's hard to pronounce. I I I uh I, I take myself off the hook for that one. Abala discovered his jiggle family, so to speak, in groups such as Facebook's Show Me Your Aspices, which has 45,000 members to date. When he found the page, he remembers being mildly horrified and immediately hooked. It was a it was fascinatingly weird stuff. Not all retro 50s aspices. The best ones are the ones from the 50s, you know, Um. That's the that's the best one. Wait, he says in mommy. Yeah, he says epidermity. I'll bring 
kill a girl in love and keep her toes and teeth. Every night I go around and still find my keep. I'll be back as soon as for Rizzo Mama's dream. Dun, dun, dun. Can I go out and kill tonight? Kill tonight. Kill a girl in love and keep her toes and teeth. Every night I go around and still find my keep. I'll be back as soon as for Rizzo Mama's dream. You know what I'm you know what I'm Every night I go around and still the time I keep pepper. I'll be back with Superman for his mama's dream. Can I go out and kill tonight? Kill tonight. Um, rip the vengeance from human next until the wet with life. Razor blade. Rip the vengeance from human next until the wet with life. Razor blade. Loves, razor blade loves. Razor blade loves teenage flesh and epidermis tea. I'll be back with souvenir for it's my mommy's dream. Hmm. Um. <clears throat> Sorry, that was weird. <laughs> what does that have to do with Jello? Nothing. <laughs> We're going crazy with Jello. Um, so when he found the page, he remembers being mildly horrified and immediately hooked. Yeah, the 50s stuff. The 50s stuff is the best because that's when they really they were taking this jello stuff seriously it was there's nothing ironic about bringing a weird ambrosia salad with a with a cornucopia of of bizarre ingredients inside as with most people in this particular internet subculture members of show me your aspices revel in the unpalatable flavor combinations that's what i find hu great humor in and that's what i think my friend bob is the same way it's the idea of unpalatable flavor combinations being passed off as palatable. That's what it is. Among the more popular blah, blah, among the more popular memes that have been circulating as of late uh, is an aspis set in a bunt pan mold, uh, swimming with diced spam, canned oysters, olives, frozen peas, carrots, kiwis. And a garnish of spray cheese. I, that's what I have on the thumbnail. Uh, Tristan and Taylor Collider, who invented the dish in 2019, dubbed it How to Get Out of Potlucks for the Rest of Your Life. It's amazing. Here it is. Here's a picture of it. Look at that thing. Look at that beast. Oh, my goodness. That is just. That is that is just unreal, man. Uh, Zach says, Jeff, I'm saying like a hundred years or so back, going hundreds of years back before calling it Jello, it was called uh, ag agar. Is that right? Yeah, I think agar. I don't know if it was if it was used a hundred years ago like that term, but I've definitely heard the term agar in reference to gelatin in some way, shape, or form, which comes from pig joints as well. It's that's how you get gummies too. If you knew how they made gummy candy, it would make you cringe. And the kosher stuff, because, you know, Jews are kosher. The kosher stuff is made from fish gelatin to get around that instead of having pig gelatin, you know, like modernity. I found it very hard to sing and play that as a cover. Yeah, dude, it's a tongue twister. Keith says meat jello sounds like a great, if not already band name. Well, there is green jello. It's not meat jello, but it's green jello. You would think that that bill would have uh capitalized on that but i guess not i don't know all right let's keep reading <clears throat> look at that look at that sucker man there's clams there is uh spray cheese kiwi carrots i mean so this is meant this was not made y you know what's kind of whack about this one like it's obviously awesome for how unpalatable it is. Like, well, the, the uh, writer did a great job of, of, of nailing that on the head. But what annoys me about it, not annoys me, but it they're they're going out of their way to be grotesque, as opposed to, I think the best ones are the ones that are unironically that are that are ironically unpalatable that are presented in some sort of serious way, and turn out to be super gross those are the ones that i live for you know what i'm saying um zach says i know mo i'm mostly i know mostly chinese restaurants the brown gravy they serve up with rice on the side is agar based um i did not know that i thought it was like cornstarch to thicken it up it's a very specific demographic these people that are into meat jellos into these jello this jello word 
world. It's a very specific demographic that is not looking into this for kitsch value. They embrace the deranged, Abola says. They want something slightly threatening. If there's some really sick combination, they love that. Me too. I wouldn't eat it, but I really love it. I love that it exists. I want a museum. I want a restaurant and I want a museum. I want it all. Give, give me all of it. Gelatin's descent into the wriggling, wriggling meat-studded molds that now invoke such disgust and delight is a fundamentally American one. And as absurd as they may appear, there was nothing accidental about them. If the deeply weird gelatin art of today reflects Americans' appetite for unsettling things in unsettling times, mid-century gelatin salads echo the rise of the nation's industrial food complex and its obsession with class, gender, and the unceasing pursuit of more. Let's take this a guy. Let's take this again. Because uh, gelatin's descent into the wriggling meat-studded molds now invoke such disgust and delight is a fundamentally American one. So this is an American tradition, this idea. And as absurd as they may appear, there was nothing accidental about them. If the deeply weird gelatin art of today... Okay, sorry, I had to like reread that again to like understand for it to register. If the deeply weird gelatin art of today reflects Americans' appetite for unsettling things in unsettling times, mid-century gelatin salads echo the rise of the nation's industrial food complex and its obsession with class, gender. Ha, huh, that's so interesting. So, wow. It's really tied with like social class sort of stuff. Interesting. In the in an era, uh, this is where the practicality comes in, historically speaking, right? In the era before refrigeration, encasing meat or seafood in an airtight collagen rich dome was an effective method of keeping harmful bacteria at bay makes sense cooks in 12th century europe quickly latched onto the concept so there is a practicality to this practice i mean it's not just it's not just being you know it's not for all the reasons that we already said i mean it was literally there was a practical reason behind food preservation you could in an era where you didn't have refrigerators, you could keep food from you could keep food from going bad longer by creating this gelatin. Long before the rise of powdered jello packets, the binding agents came from all sorts of sources. The boiled feet of pigs or calves. How did they find that out? They must have been boiling pigs or calves and um you know, uh, figured out that this stuff was like really gooey and and that it works. Um, the boiled feet of pigs and calves or the bones and heads of river fish were popular options. Well, we talked about that already with, with the kosher population, but hardly the only options. Grated uh, heart shorn from the dried antlers of a stag or uh, insing glass from the swimming bladder of a sturgeon made for an almost instant jelly wow that is okay so kevin is saying kevin is saying that it, uh, agar is made from what red algae jacob says that bha which is contained in 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 this stuff is carcinogenic doesn't surprise me uh brian says I remember when Vienna sausages came in gelatin. Now it's just some runny stuff in the can. Right. Used to be a lot more substance, a lot more density. And now it's it's all but disappeared. Right. Um, cooking bones and joints and things have that have a lot of natural gelatin is far more of a linear path than jello, which is basically the bastardized version of that says Bonnie Morales, chief and co-owner uh, co of Kachka, uh, a Russian restaurant in Portland, Oregon. Uh, Morales serves uh, kohol, uh, dets, which is a savory meat aspis popular in a number of Eastern European cultures during the cooler months. People think that meat aspects is this crazy anomaly. And in reality, the idea of taking gelatin 
which is an animal product to begin with, and refining it and adding sugar and fruit to it is actually the abomination. Huh. It's true. Like, meat belongs in a meat product versus taking fruit and sugar and combining it with a meat product. And that that's real. I mean, that's that's what the deal is, right? In Ukraine, uh, Kolodets has long held a special place on festive tables around Christmas and New Year's. For Elisa Liu, head chef of Veliselka, a Ukrainian restaurant in New York City, Kolodets, I'm just but butchering words left and right, has always been an expression of love as well as a visual medium for the cook to show off. My sister's mother-in-law would make the pastry look like river reeds and would cut carrots into little fish, she says. I always thought of it in its presentation because uh, I always, oh, no, it's always thoughtful in its presentation because they wanted it to shine. That makes sense. That, 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 that tracks. Look at it. Look at that thing, man. That is weird, man. That's meat jello. That's what it is. It's meat jello straight up. The opportunity for showmanship in a major re uh, uh, the opportunity for showmanship. Uh, uh, I can't read. The opportunity for showmanship is a major reason why aspices were once the food of kings and emperors, which goes back to the idea of class, of how class is involved, right? Uh, according to a 1546 manuscript, one of King Henry VIII's favorite dishes was a ruby-hued jelly of spice-infused wine. Maestro of hot cuisine, Marie Antoinette uh, Carême's elaborate truffle-studded aspices were the glory of the 18th century French and Russian courts. In the 1800s, taffel spits, salts, an aspis, with boiled beef was a favorite dish of the Austrian imperial family served at the Grand Hotel uh, Satcher in Vienna. An aspis meant that you either had time on your hands or the capital for domestic servants or professional, professional cooks, not to mention the luxury of some form of re refrigeration. Aspices, in other words, were exclusive. So it became it basically becomes a status symbol. It's the equivalent of eating shellfish today, like you know, King Alaskan crab legs or lobster or crab, snow crab, or um, you know, um, oysters on the half shell and caviar. Uh, all of these things are status symbols because you need money to be able to pay for them. When wealthy Europeans migrated across the Atlantic, many brought uh, many brought their cooks and aspis recipes with them. At the end of the 19th century, in the United States, savory aspises still carried a certain air of continental elitism. In an 1874 portrait, that's the one that, that we first started the show with up above, uh, Jules Harder, the chef at the Palace Hotel in San Francisco, holds an aspis crown with a whole lobster that's been impaled with a miniature sword. Aspices like harders were, after all, labor intensive, were labor intensive, requiring either soaking whole gelatin sheets or making stock from scratch. So there's so much energy and effort and so much finesse that that's where the status symbol comes from. The process was probably very expensive. Then in 1893, Sarah Tyson Ro uh, Rohrer. An American food writer, an early member of the domestic science movement, wrote a letter to the Knox Company. Uh, women were already compacting their salads into aspis form, uh, but soaking gelatin sheets was a pain, were noted. What if the company came up with an easier powdered option? Within the next year, Knox's sparkling granulated gelatin, a powder that dissolved instantly, was on the market. Knox capitalized on its product's malleability with a public recipe contest in 1905 for creating molded gelatin dishes. Fanny Farmer herself served as a judge, and the resulting recipes inspired American housewives to feature their own jiggling centerpieces at their next dinner party. And it would go on like that for the next 50 or 60 years to an extent.
whether you know in and out of popularity maybe but yeah i mean when after world war ii that there was a big rise look at that knock sparkling gelatin and you can do with you could do it with japanese deep sea crab meat that was a recipe you take your crab meat you take your gelatin you mix it together and you get this abomination a 1910 crab meat salad with knock sparkling gelatin ingredients include chopped olives and mayonnaise yuck i love how mayonnaise becomes the icing of these gelatin cakes that's what that's what it ends up doing it didn't take long after the arrival of sparkling granulated gelatin for another innovator to find a better way to brand it in 1897 a new york carpenter named pearl weight pat did the name jello while knox gelatin was unflavored Wait started producing lemon, orange, raspberry, and strawberry options. Two years later, or, uh, Orator Woodward, an inventor and founder of the Gen Genesee Pure Food Company, bought the patent for Jell-O for a mere $450, or around $4,000 today. Could you imagine? Think about all the billions that Jell-O has made, especially when they had c c c <laughs> Um. You think Cosby is uh, shucking, you know, Jello in prison right now? He's got his Jello Jello cups. Did he get out of jail? Actually, I don't remember. When my great 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 uncle—that's three greats—great great great uncle bought the patent to Jello, he initially had trouble selling it," said Ali Robottom, an heiress to the Jello fortune and the author of the book Jello Girls. People weren't sure what to do with it. Woodward quickly found his niche. Given that the home cooking was still largely a feminized domain, it was inevitable that a new foods pro uh, new food product products marketing strategy would be gendered. But Jello as a brand lead towards, uh, sorry, but Jello as a brand leaned in more than most. It did not fear men in its at, uh, advi uh, God, I can't read. I'm so tired. My, my eyes are heavy. But Jello as a brand leaned in more than most. It did not feature men in its advertisements until well into the 1990s. I hate it when that happens. We good? We good? We're good. Sorry about that. Um, son of a bong. All right, let's keep going. Uh, American women have been so culturally indoctrinated to be care. I, we, you missed that, right? Uh, but Jello as a brand leaned in more than most it did not feature men in its advertisements till well into the 1990s um you know jello is also kind of sticky and you know what else is sticky stickers just like riot stickers and as you can see riot stickers is our sponsor you're sponsored by riot stickers they did this beautiful banner behind me uh you should go and check out uh riotstickers.com which is our website for our sponsor check them out i mean their stickers are great they're made out of vinyl uh, they do great in the weather and the outdoors you, you just can't do and and sharpie is the best to do business with man he's just such an easygoing helpful laid back hard-working guy so give riot stickers your business riotstickers.com link in the description and of course we're gonna do our little Friggin' thing if I could get it up. Ow, my back hurts. Mm. Oy vey. Oy vey, Gavolt. I'm feeling I'm feeling old is what I'm feeling. One second here, people, while we pull out the riot stickers.com. Here it is. Riotstickers.com.
I am falling asleep, people. I need some coffee. Fading. I'm fading. All right, let's keep going. Let's keep going. American women have been so culturally indoctrinated to be caretakers, Robottom says. Early advertisements for Knox Gelatin and Jello promised har harried housewives convenience, a way to put something that felt high class on the table with their ever shrinking time. So something that was once this high class sort of, you know, status symbol becomes once it becomes dehydrated, it turns into this very common commodity for the nuclear family a way to feel fancy with a, with 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 a dish that was old older and you know um a way to do fancy stuff it, it, i i can under for the first time ever i can understand how jello you know how this stuff comes to be i'm gonna lean back a little bit because my back is hurting i hope you'll forgive me Move this over oh it's so much better Sorry for the, if there's any mic handling noise, let me know. Okay. Ah, yeah, that's nice. That is so much better. Woo. All right. I can keep going for a little bit longer now. Um, <clears throat> so where were we? Jello, according to Robottom, was portrayed as a way for them to take care of their duties at home and still manage a million other things they had to do. Something about that felt very aligned with American values. So what, what we're talking about here really is a form of misogyny, sort of. Within just two years, Woodward's annual sales were, were more than $250,000, which is more than $8 million today. So he hit it big with the Jell-O molds. Look at that. Look at that early-ass Jell-O jello mold right there and you could see their radishes cut up in there with some other greenery maybe those are bell peppers that is so bizarre here is woodward and a recipe for yeah that's a crisp radish salad set in lemon jello so it's lemon jello with radishes that is super bizarre super duper bizarre i don't know um Jeff, I have a question for you that's kind of off days from the Jello topic. You thought uh, uh, thought about packaging your movie and selling a DVD for your list? Yes, Zach, that, I, I appreciate that. That is off topic, but I do appreciate that. Uh, no, Dagger, it is not. Dagger, it is not. It is meat, Dagger, but it's, you know what it is? It's, um, it, it's made out of pig's, it's, it's pig's knuckles. It's pig's. It's pig joints. It's cow. Yes, there's cow in there, too. There's all sorts of stuff in there. All sorts of stuff. For sure. Um, yes, Zach, the movie will be available for distribution. Um, but I'm going to stay on topic because I'm fading. I'm literally going to fall asleep if I don't finish this. And I want to keep my energy up for the rest of the article. Uh, so that's crazy. That's that's lime. And, and Dagger, you know what else? Hey, Dagger. It's also uh, they use fish. If it's kosher, they use uh, fish gelatin, fish jelly instead. Right. Um, this whole phenomenon is a poster child for conspicuous consumption. It's food that looks like something spectacular, says Laura Shapiro, who spent uh, who spent years of re uh, blah, blah, who spent years researching the rise of gelatin salads for her book Perfection Salad. Um, in large part because of her total bewilderment as to why any rational human being would want to make her eat them. <laughs> There's this combination of social mobility and the rising incomes and people moving into the middle class, Shapiro says. For several decades in the early 20th century, jello salads were a way to display that a woman had both the leisure time to prepare them and a refrigerator with which to store them. So, so there you go. So the jello again, it's a, it's all about status. It's all about class. Oh my God. I could literally write a, a movie about like, like arch nemesis housewives competing to make the best jello jello salads. I mean, that is like my dream right now. That's so interesting, of course. So you're showing off 
your status. You're not showing off with the jello, but having the jello says, Hey, I have a refrigerator that can keep things cold. And that's what it's really all about. You are sending an unspoken message. That's what it is, man. That's what it is. And that you have leisure time. Gelatin also became untethered from any sort of courtly tradition. Instead, the test kitchens at Knox Company and the Jello Company, the latter of which was sold in 1925 to the uh, Postum Cereal Company, Inc., uh, which would later become the General Foods Company, which would subsequently be swallowed by the tobacco conglomerate Philip Morris Companies in 1985 to form Kraft Foods, Inc., Churned out bizarre combinations. Wow, that is some chain. The way that corporation swallows up corporation swallows up corporation, right? But now we're untethered to courtly tradition. So all of a sudden, the the gelatin, the jello becomes a conduit for whatever you want. As jello introduced new artificial flavors. Recipes increasingly relied on electric-hued lime, lemon, and other saccharine options in lieu of unflavored gelatin. Like the Betty Crocker Test Kitchen, these laboratories would have an outsized influence on American dietary habits for decades to come. That's crazy. So the people who are thinking up these recipes are then putting them in cookbooks and putting them on the backs of boxes, and then people are cooking and eating them. They are taste makers and they're not just taste makers they are indeed shaping the american dietary habits uh, that's just that that's mind boggling to me man that's why they're so weird shapiro says they came out of the fevered imagination of someone in a test kitchen not from some medieval banquet jello was so successful as a concept that the brand name all but supplanted gelatin in the american vernacular which is which happens with like you know Tylenol and you know ibuprofen and yada 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 all that stuff right Advil, uh, fr- uh band aids, you know that sort of thing. From 1920s up until the early 70s, popular recipes would include perfection salad, an amalgamation of cabbage, Miracle Whip, and canned pineapple, set in both lemon and lime Jello. And I've heard of this under the sea salad, a marine scene with chunks of canned pears swimming beneath a shamrock hue jello surface. Could you imagine going to jello party? Oh my God, that would just be wonderful. No normal person would go into the kitchen and think these things, think of these things, Shapiro said. It's just one egregious ingredient after another. What is the goal here? It can't be to make something that tastes good. According to Shapiro, flavor was never the point. The rise of these unhinged jello salads was fueled by the domestic science movement, a push started by women in the late 1800s who believed, as Shapiro writes in Perfection Salad, if they could reform American eating habits, they could reform Americans. So we're going to get to your behavior through your food and what you eat. By the 1950s, General Foods had hundreds of women working in 53 test kitchens spread across 17 states. Although most of them labored in virtual anonymity, Shapiro believes they were dedicated in their mission to reshape America's relationship with food. The General Foods and Kitchens Cookbook, first published in 1959, detailed all sorts of scenarios and meals from an or, for an ordinary ordinary american family throughout the year much like silicon valley's current fixation on optimizing nutrition the women leading the domestic science movement wanted to create food that was modern clean and efficient wow look at these recipes man and then here you have some recipes the idea was that everything your mother did was outdated now we have to do things according to all these new rigorous methods shapiro says domestic science was the new science for women you had scientific motherhood and cooking and charity and here you go tuna fish salad perfection salad jewel salad cheese salad cucumber salad and then salmon mold 
just let all of those titles uh, capture your imagination uh, at, at what they would be like. If I wasn't so tired and if I could see the print better, I would try and read to you some of these some of these uh, recipes. I mean, it would just be fun to just do a, your own kitchen and just test them out, right? So this is actually a cookbook from 1915, the Knox Dainty Desserts for Dainty People, Salads and Savories, Knox Sparkling Gelatin. Wow. Just wow. Okay, so both Shapiro and Rowbottom suggest that the over-the-top nature of some of these jello salads may lie in the creative frustration of the women who invented them. So they're in these test kitchens. They're in the test kitchens and they probably have to pr prove their paycheck. They have to show that they are, are earning it. And so they're coming up, they're they're pulling their hair out and they're trying to figure out what the what the you know what they could do. I love that. It's so true. Creative frustration brought on by women making meat jello molds in her book the secret history of home economics how trailblazing women harness the power of home and change the way we live uh danielle uh daring like derailinger points to leaders of the domestic science and home economics movement like lillian uh gilbreth the university of california at berkeley's first woman valid victorian who designed a hyper-efficient kitchen in the 1920s. And Ellen Richards, a chemist at MIT in the 1870s, who managed to obtain funding for a woman's laboratory, but only as long as it focused, uh, as long as the focus is on nutrition and sanitation. Because God forbid, because God forbid women, you know, science up anything else. God forbid, right? Um... <laughs> It's crazy to think that only nutrition and sanitation. It's so ridiculous. You don't want women students taking chemistry and biology. So you shut them. So you shunt them off to home economics. Shapiro says they were trained in science and chemistry and they channeled that in into how do I turn this into dessert? So they wound up developing recipes for Betty Crocker. The uh, the result of giving brilliant women no outlet beyond the domestic sphere was a corporate. Uh, sorry, I, I, again, I'm like falling asleep here. The result of giving brilliant women no outlet beyond the domestic sphere was corporate test kitchens full of minds that in later decades may have ended up in laboratories channeling their knowledge of chemistry into jello molds and boxed cakes mi boxed cake mixes making women's work like cooking more scientific was on some level an attempt to escape from its confines unlike messy freeform cooking gelatin salads required precise measurements it resulted in food that appeared orderly and contained and didn't require the diner dirtying their fingers. I, I guess, I and mean, that's assuming that everybody has knives, forks, and plates. The women of the Knox company, that's amazing. So the women come up with these crazy recipes because they're so bored and they're just trying to innovate. And that's how you get all the crazy recipes. There's a logical explanation for something that seemed so illogical to me, the idea of these weird juxtapositions of, of, of jello. But now I, I get it a little bit more. I get it. Um, by the 1910s and 20s, glossy full pay colored magazines were in homes all over the country telling women to explicitly and implicitly what sort of life they should strive for. Sorry, so you're telling women explicitly and implicitly what sort of life they should strive for. A gelatin mold on the cover of Gourmet was guaranteed to turn heads no matter what it tasted like. Some of these gelatin preparations were definitely seen as aspirational and high class something that you would achieve to look sophisticated and chic, uh, Shapiro says. In the early 1900s, recipes like Franny Farmer's ginger ale salad would appear in Woman's Home Compilation, a magazine catering to the upper middle class. If you're 
just coming back from eight hours of work at the factory, you don't have time for this kind of thing. So it gains a class identity from the tables it sets up and the people who are serving it. Sorry, I'm literally about to pass out here. Hold on, comments. Angus. Yeah, Angus, I knew you lived in Utah because we were talking about the res before. Remember that episode? Dagger says jello shots, pig flesh, and booze. Oh my God. And stomachs. Yum, yum, yum. Yum, yum. Eat them up. As Sal V used to say. Um, a gelatin mola. Okay. So some of these gelatin preparations were definitely seen as aspirational and high class. Something that you would want to achieve to look sophisticated and chic, and you'd imagine that these the these housewives or whoever is reading magazines with all these fancy salads and trying to like outdo each other that way too, sort of like cutthroat style, right? Um, a magazine. Sorry, so it would appear in a woman's home compilation, a magazine catering to the upper middle class. If you've just come back from eight hours of work at the factory, you don't have time for this kind of thing. So it gains a class identity from the tables it sits upon and the people who are serving it. <laughs> That's nuts. Chicken force meatballs. Look at this stuff. Crown of fruit, bourbon cups, mock cherry pie, chicken force meatballs, Egyptian cabbage. Molded lamb heart, De deviled lobster. Wow, deviled freaking lobster, man. Uh, royal salad, carrot pudding. Wow, oh, guys, you're feeling the clip from the San Francisco from 1900 with a recipe for molded lamb hearts. Yeah, that's nuts. That is less. With the hardships of the Great Depression, World War II rationing, American Jello salads became a way to stretch leftover scraps into something greater than the sum of their parts. So again, another level of practicality to stretch the you know the the, the weekly food groceries for the an average family, right? On some level, you just put you just take what you got and you put it in there and yada yada yada. You put it in the pot. Uh, the company shaped its message to fit the times. When Americans needed to economize, Jello was marked as an affo as affordable. When they had no time to get dinner on the table, it was marked as convenient, and so easy a child could do it. When all they wanted low fat, low sugar, everything the company leaned into with the idea of Jello as a guiltless guiltless dessert. Although, you know what, man, like. I think that that is a little, I'm like literally falling asleep. My eyes are like half open right now. <laughs> you can't see behind these glasses, but I'm really tired. But they wanted a low fat, blah, 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 it, as jello as a guilt. I don't even remember what I was about to say. I was about to say something and I like totally forgot. The company shared its message to fit the times and Americans need to economize. Jello's market is affordable and they had no time to go to the dinner. Yeah. Yeah. They could put everything they want in there. The more the brand sold the idea of Jell-O's act, the more the brand sold the the uh, the more the uh, oh my god I can't I can't think. The more the brand sold the idea of Jell-O's accessibility, the less it came to be viewed as a high class as high class. By the 1990s, Jell-O had become a convenience product. A a a a wan. A, a, a wan? A uh, Weight Watchers approved substitute for real cake and the food spoon fed to hospital patients. Jello Je sales fell 371 million between 20, 2009 and 2018. Much like the 1960s and 70s, however, when Jello meat so salads were already falling out of fashion in many parts of the country, they hung on to. They hung on in regional pockets of the Midwest and the American South, Utah, yada, 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 yada. In particular, uh, it has a long held, it has long held onto its official title as the nation's jello belt for its enduring, 
the uh, in enduring popularity whoever watches this in the future should be like what's happening to him is he just like dr i'm like drifting uh i'm drifting off uh that is the history of jello it is constantly shape-shifting and remaking itself robottom says it's inherently american I, I mean i do agree that it's american yeah uh ken uh abala is waiting to bet that the podium of history is poised to swing back in American gelatin's favor, and he's not alone. There are particular patterns of popularity, and I think uh, gelatin's return is inevitable, he says. I think we will be a new interaction that I'm hoping to be a part of, and I'm hoping to be a part of it. Um, what exactly that iteration will be remains to be seen, although it's currently mutating in two directions. The avant-garde nightmare dishes of the internet and the high-end creations of chefs. Many like the early 20th century, much like the early 20th century, gelatin is perfect fit for the visual medium and the dominant American popular culture. What's more, our distrust of science and technology is waiting. Uh, Abala says, we're beginning to trust in the food industry again. Woo! Um, and here we have some fish, some fish jello. <laughs> it's great. The American gastronomic zeitgeist appears to be veering away from a decades-long paranoia about anything edible to come out of a laboratory. Res restaurants are proudly announcing the presence of monosodium glutamate msg a synthetic version of a naturally incurring compound in dishes and cocktails uh tech-based meat alternatives are booming and an american gelatin is back baby sort of members of show me your aspices who abala says i'll Albala says are more women and no non-binary folks in their 30s may lean into the weirdest of aspices, but a number of chefs are taking them more seriously. Part of the part of that comes from a, a canny ap appreciation for how well luminous wiggly food resources across social media platforms are. In Brooklyn, boozy jelly cakes, essentially grown up jello shots, are selling briskly at 80 dollars a pop isn't that crazy freaking meat jello who would have thought other chefs in the united states are see seeking aspis inspiration from cultures that didn't quite <coughs> <coughs> that didn't quite go so haywire with their jellies Southeast and East Asian jellied sweets set with agar agar. There you go. Whoever said it was made from red algae. The agar agar are rising in popularity in the U.S. and as the occasionally savory aspices, as are the occasionally savory aspices. At Mason Nico, a Michelin starred restaurant in San Francisco, Chief Nico de la Roque is making aspices set in fish-based stock. I would imagine if you're going to eat one of these, you know, jellos, it has to be seasoned in some way, shape, or form if it's not like a fruit variety, you know? So here's the fish. There's your fish loaf right there. And your gelatin. That's a seafood-filled aspic at Madison Nico. Uh, I didn't know Aspices, he said, had some bad reputation here, as we've seen as outdated. De La Roque says his creations are decidedly unobtainable to anyone but the most ambitious of home cooks, right? Um, <sighs> dishes like his Aspic de homad and buya buya bays i don't know if i said that. i'd probably butchered that and topped with the whole lobster tail are more in line of what chef marie antoinette uh carame carme 
may have presented to a French monarch. Hmm. The visual component is pretty important here because at the end of the day, people are not sure about a savory gelatin meat unless it looks great. Right. So it has to look good in order to, if you're going to eat it. Right. Um, they're on display in a refrigerator case under LED light. So it's almost like a spotlight. Uh, the auspices have a lot of intrigue, so they kind of stand alone. But restaurant food is not the same as home cooked food. The fact that auspices attract attention on Facebook, Pinterest, and TikTok are incredibly demanding in terms of time and labor. Time and labor. Ah, I, I, I literally I can't look at the screen anymore. It's hurting my eyes. But restaurant food is not the same as home cooked food. The fact that these auspices attract are attracting attention on Facebook, Pinterest, and TikTok are incredibly demanding in terms of time and labor. Means that once they're, uh, a, they're the, oh my God, my brain is not working anymore. They're once again unobtainable to the average amateur cook. So the status symbol has actually gone up. Right, that's what it is. Right. The status symbol is back up to be a jello baron is a popular thing. It's not like a trashy thing anymore. The domestic scientists wanted to bury the past in order to present society towards the future. These modern day aspices makers will tell you to know that their creations, both the deranged and the delicious are decidedly not your grandma's jello. There you have it, folks. Woo. I am literally going to pass out now. I'm so tired. And that's perfect. We, we, we're, we're just at an hour. That's what we wanted, everybody. Just an hour. So you checked out our sponsor, riotsickers.com. I am selling T-shirts. I want to tell you guys something. I'm selling T-shirts, and the money that comes from the T-shirts is going to go towards festival submission fees, which I cannot currently afford at this point in time. So if you're feeling froggy, pick up a shirt or uh you know buy a coffee or anything like that uh, help is always appreciated in trying to keep this uh this dream alive it's not easy um but the 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 clothes are not for me they're for my son he's got a thing and i love watching him see do thing i'd like to watch him do stuff it's awesome so without further ado i just want to say peace and hair grease thank you for tuning in with me We'll see you next time, probably tomorrow night. I don't know. Time will, time will tell. Maybe, maybe the boy will grow up, and that will be that. The boy. What did I just say? The boy will grow up. <laughs> what the fuck did I just say that for? What does that mean? Maybe the boy will grow up. Like that's where my brain is at right now. Like I literally can't talk anymore. Like I'm kind of embarrassed to even be on here <laughs> right now. Oh, that's right. We we're going to do the thing. I was going to say peace and hair grease, maybe. Is that what I was going to say? Buy t-shirts. Peace and hair grease. Love you all. You guys rule. Uh, I'm out. I'll see you next time. Patreon. Hey, guys. What's going on? It's Jeff. So I've decided to make a Patreon. What is Patreon? I don't know how to define a Patreon. Let me look it up. Patreon is a membership platform that makes it very easy for creators to get paid for the things that they're already creating. I want to do it full time. I want this to be my full time job. In my efforts to make that happen, I've set up this platform. Is it going to work? Is it going to be successful? I don't know, but I would rather try and crash and burn than not try at all. The goal is to create enough passive revenue so that I can continue to do this full time uninterrupted. Why? Because I love to do this. I love creating content. I love making videos. I love shooting films. I love doing podcasts. In case you couldn't tell, I love to talk and I never shut the fuck up. <laughs> so right now I've kept the Patreon incredibly simple. There's two tiers and that may change in the future. The Murdergram is a simple way to extend support for all of the hours and hours of free content on the channel for nothing more than a dollar. 38 cents goes to Patreon. What's a buck 38, eh? It's less than a cup of coffee, but it's a great way that you can show support for very little effort. When you divide that dollar 38 by the hours and hours and hours of time spent listening to this 
endless drivel of content, the dollar cost average works out. Next up is the YouTube casualty for $6.66. Oh. <laughs> The YouTube casualty is loaded to the gills. Enjoy the archive ad-free as well as ad-free early access to special docu-style podcast videos, music reaction commentaries, and the like a month before they drop on YouTube, loaded with ads, I might add. You're also going to get exclusive content and behind-the-scenes content that is not available on YouTube or anywhere else. So you get to peek behind the veil. And believe me, there's a couple of choice pieces. Most of all, more than anything, whether you join the Patreon or not, I just want to thank each and every one of you that comes to the channel, that watches all the shows, that leaves comments, that participates, that subscribes. That's really the most important thing. This is just trying to find a way to earn a living as an artist. And with that, thank you for my TED Talk. Join the Patreon, because we need you! 66 cents.